What's up, Closers? Dominic Caminata here with Garasa University. We've got another exciting episode of our Yes, I Am a Closer podcast. And I'm exceptionally excited about this episode. This is with a gentleman that is literally clear across the other side of the world. So this gentleman actually resides currently in Bali, Indonesia. But really, his rise to becoming who he is today stems from the UK. So this gentleman has an extensive history in the home services space. As a matter of fact, he was a sales director of a company called Everest Home Improvements in the UK. Basically, this guy managed over $150 million worth of business and grew it to one of the most successful home improvement companies in the history of the UK. This guy's an absolute monster. And if that wasn't enough, his 14 years or more in the home services space, within one year of moving on from being the sales manager at Everest Home Improvements, this gentleman became the sales coach of the year for the entire UK. This is a very prestigious award, only awarded to a handful of people. And he was awarded the, the sales coach of the year award for the UK, an absolute monster of a sales coach. And basically since that time in, in his history, he hasn't looked back. This gentleman has gotten extensive training on negotiation, obviously sales coaching, training, mentorship, building sales teams, you name it. This guy is an absolute powerhouse of a sales coach and a trainer. We're honored to have him on our show. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce the one and only Mr. Paul Atherton. So Paul, welcome to our show. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be on our Yes, I'm a Closer podcast. Hi, Dom. I'm excellent, thank you, Dom. What an introduction. I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, who's this guy? I want to meet him. <laughs> you know, I look at your life story, and one of the reasons I was really excited to have you on our podcast is... Really, your entire life has been infatuated with sales experience, and then to see where you've taken in your lifetime, I was really fascinated with your story, and I think a lot of our viewers would find it very inspiring as well. So kind of what I want to get to the root of is kind of the early Paul Atherton, where he found this inspiration to be the sales icon, and really your rise to becoming a sales leader in the world today. Okay, thanks, Tom. Well, of, of, of everything I, I'll talk about, the, the, what I'm, I always am I'm left with is a great feeling of serendipity in that, you know, it's kind of just unfolded um, out of a fascination that I discovered at seven years old. And um, I never had, I never had specific plans about, uh, you know, spending my entire life uh, studying sales and persuasion and, and potential and all the rest of it. But I was fascinated from, from seven years old. And as I now look back, there actually couldn't have been any alternative. Nothing gripped me as much as the, uh, when I made the discovery as a young lad, and it was, you know, I'll try, I'll keep this bit, I'll try and keep this bit really succinct, but it's, it stemmed from this kind of genesis point. When I was seven or eight, uh, in pr primary school, little kid, kiddie school um there was a, a christmas play they were going to do and they nominated me to be kind of like the grandfather to figure take talking to his grandson about the christian story and stuff and, and the bible story and it was it was the main part and i immediately went into fear when i was the teacher told me it was me and i was you know absolutely um terrified and over the course of the next few days, I, 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 I was trying to find ways to get out of it, you know. And it was clear that I wasn't going to be able to get out of it that easily without feeling really guilty. Yeah. Um, now, long story short, what I, what I discovered was if I changed the way I thought, I changed the way I felt. And that's fairly, in today's culture, that's, that's no big deal. It's no revelation. But to me, a seven-year-old in 1977, it was a huge discovery because the, the idea that came to me was, this is a grandfather, I'm acting a grandfather. If I'm him and if I, if I lose, if, if, the conclusion I came to is, if I lose the identity of me and I actually totally lose myself in the identity of the grandfather, mm -hmm. I won't have Paul to worry about. You know, and that concept led to a, a, a just a fall in the way of fear and it, it slightly just opened the door to the fact that my thinking about my identity and um, in any given situation what my role was if the, my, the nature of my thinking determined the nature of my feeling and the minute I made this mental switch from being Paul the kid who's 
amongst all of his peers on stage, he could really screw it up to the grandfather who's, there's no risks whatsoever. Mentally, there was a shift. The fear just fell away right. completely in that moment. And since then, I was fascinated by thinking, by the potential of changing your entire state and perception just by changing the way you think. And that then pretty much set me on a course, a trajectory to, um, the, the, that trajectory, that course then was, you know, unavoidable. And it, it, it led me to, as a young, young guy in school, I started to encourage others. I got so much out of um, helping others to achieve their potential. And um, I, I was like captain of teams and stuff in school. I got so much satisfaction out of seeing, seeing people achieve their potential, um, going further than people thought we could. Mm -hmm. breaking perceptions, all that sort of stuff. It's like a sort of person, it was more like personal development than sales, if anything. It was kind of just a, a paradigm shift. That happened at such a young age that by the time I got to 16, I knew that I wanted to, when I left school, I wanted to get into a, 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 a career that, that was, that, that lent itself to this attitude, which is all about the nature of your thinking determines the nature of your reality. The only limits that exist are the ones you put on yourself. So I ended up getting into sales. So that was the start. That yeah. was the, the, the very beginning. It was so powerful that whilst I left school with very little in terms of academic education, I was so far ahead of my peers because I'd already made the ultimate discovery that most people don't ever make unless they get into personal development or sales or, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're lucky enough to be given an opportunity to discover it for themselves. I can tell you sincerely, until I read books like Think and Grow Rich or The Psychology yeah. of Selling, I mean, that was in my mid-20s maybe that I discovered those types of books. And that's really that pivotal point in my life where I really had that epiphany. So for you to have that in your childhood at such a young age, is, is very unusual. Certainly, I could see how that would was. propel you forward in a lot of those aspects. And that was the thing that I could tell about you right away that, you know, I really admired is the fact that you love sales for what it is, but I think mm. it, it gives you a lot of fulfillment in your life is helping others succeed and seeing them develop into true all-stars, right? It gives you a lot of fulfillment. And I think a lot of the great ones have that, that mentality where, you know, I want to pour my heart into the profession of selling and develop others and I get fulfillment seeing them succeed. I think that's kind of yes. something that's lost these days, right? That developing that culture where that, that leader, that commander who's educating their sales team. A lot of times I see managers talking down to their sales team or basically strutting around like <laughs> they're God's gift to selling and they're not doing anything yeah. to build yeah. those people up. And uh, yeah, I think your story, to find that discovery at such a young age, is it, pretty remarkable, to be honest with you. Yeah, it is. It's, it's unusual. And, and as, as I said earlier, it's the serendipity of it. If I, if I reflect on all the, the truly greatest, most satisfying moments and inspirational moments, they all happened w as a result of me looking for something else or not looking at all. Yeah. You know? um, and, and when I've gone out purposely looking with, with willpower behind it and um, trying to make discoveries for my own benefit, yeah. that's, never, that's never taken me to, to the great discoveries. It's taken me down the road of ruin. You mm -hmm. know? Um, but when I let go and, um, and just kind of jump into the stream of life uh, uh, and let it take me, that's where the that's where life comes to me. That's where the discoveries come to me. And I, I kind of have concluded now, at forty nine years of age, that what's what what I'm supposed to do and the role I'm supposed to play is going to come to me. I don't actually need to go and chase it. If I need to go and chase it, it's a good. Uh, it's actually a clue that it's not for me. Because if it was, I'd already have it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> which is a very simple conclusion. It took me forty two years to make that conclusion. <laughs> you know, that uh, reminds me of a quote that I honestly live by. This is something, you know, kind of my motto is, you know, success doesn't bring you happiness. Happiness brings you success. Yeah. What you found yeah. is 
you have found something that truly gives you a fulfillment and happiness in your life. And that natural serendipity, that happiness, that fulfillment you feel, that passion you have for what you do, naturally is just going to lead to more and more success, especially if you're imprinting that on the people you're surrounding yourself with and influencing others as a result, it's just going to spread naturally on its own. Yeah. And that's a very yeah. good lesson a lot of people need to learn. A lot of people go out and pursue success and they think, when I'm successful, I'll be happy. And like you said, they end up hitting a dead end and ends up you know, leading to ruin and misery. Whereas if yeah, they focus on themselves internally first, making that decision, I can be happy right now and change my life in a way where I'm doing things that give me that fulfillment, that serendipity, and that's going to lead to greater levels of success naturally on its own. I don't necessarily have to hunt it down. It's absolutely. going to come to me. Don't get me wrong. It's not all being a bed of roses. It's absolutely being devastated. It's been, I've had the euphoric highs beyond my wildest dreams, but also devastating loss. Yeah. Um, because of what we've already discussed, you know, devastating loss um, as a result of losing the, if you like, innocence yeah. Uh, and uh, becoming seduced by money, power, status, material wealth, and, and all of that stuff, which has always been a part of sales, great success, unlimited earnings, um, a, a terrific career advancement, you know, running businesses, make, you know, it's, there's unlimited potential. And I did veer off in, into the dark side, and, uh, uh, and um, you know, that ended up in, you know, alcoholism, rehab, massive loss, financially. I achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve. I was 37 years old, and in the year of my greatest earnings were on paper or from the outside, I had achieved everything I'd ever set myself, every goal I'd ever set for my life, yep. I had achieved, and I had it at age 37, but I was so in, in, internally broken yeah. and dissatisfied, and I felt no self-esteem and no pain and no glory because I'd fallen for this illusion that I will be satisfied, fulfilled, complete when I get the, all, all of the life stuff, the, the wife, the two kids, the house, the holidays around the world, the first class, this, the German cars outside, all of that. And I'm running a business with hundreds of salespeople. And I, 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 you know, I'm the guy on the stage doing the motivational speeches and all the rest of it. Um, when I get all of that, I'll be complete. Yeah. And of course, it was revealed to me that when I actually got all of that, I wasn't. In fact, I was the reverse. <laughs> I, I was, I, I, I was the, the least happy I'd ever been. And the only thing that gave me pleasure was a bottle of Jack Daniels. And, you know, we've all seen how that wang ends up. And yeah. it did end up that way. But that then led me to another opportunity. You know, I didn't, I just, I didn't know what I'm telling you now. I didn't have this wisdom. Yeah. I was always going to go down that road. It was always going to be part of my story. It was unavoidable. In fact, the quicker I got there, the better to make the discovery I did. And it was, in the, it was at the lowest point that I discovered, again, in, in very much like the innocence of, of when I was seven years old, it was kind of like, right, okay, here I am in rehab. This is, now what's got me here? My best thinking, yeah. my, my inspired strategy. Yeah. So my very best thinking and all this charm I've got and the in intellect and experience and abilities, this has actually led me here. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that tell me? What does that tell me? It tells me that my own thinking and strategy, when, it's, when all of the gifts have been given, when I employ them all in my own interests to try and cover myself in glory and take care of my own needs only, it's, it, it, it does not have any benefit to anybody else. But I'm going against the force of nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that was the discovery. I wasn't put here to cover myself in glory. Uh, I was put here for other reasons. I was put here to be part of something bigger and to contribute to it and create something to be proud of and something great, which is always going to be about working with others. And I hadn't really made, I'd made that discovery as a youngster, but I'd lost it because of all this crap, frankly, which is money and power and everything else. Right. So that conclusion was, you know, my own best thinking when everything's centered on me, this is where it comes. It gets to this point. It's, it gets to. It, I, I lead straight to the to the dark side. A bit like cro the, the movie Crossroads. It sells your soul to the devil. In my case, actually, not in everybody's. This is not. I'm not making any judgment for anybody else. But in, in my case, that's what happened. So I was able to 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 make a a shift and a complete reposition yeah. and reframe 
because that discovery then enabled me, it just jettisoned me to a whole new freedom where, where the pursuit of success and money and material wealth and power and everything else was, it was no longer on the agenda. It didn't even feature. It didn't even feature. I once again fell in love with the, the truth of contributing and being part of something bigger and focusing on helping others. And I rediscovered that, you know what, the, the, in, in, in summarizing this little piece of story, the greatest discovery of all, um, Dom, and this is really where it, the rubber meets the road for me. Yeah. And it, 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 it's, it's now as a sales leader or whatever I am, I'm still a sales guy, I always will be my salesman. Yeah. Always have been, always will be. But we do different roles. We're different hats, don't we? It's today it's coach. You know, that's great. Love that. But it's the same truth beneath it. And when I was a, when I was a salesman at 19 and I made a discovery, in other, in, in another incredible circumstances, that discovery left me a feeling of, I've made a difference to somebody's life because of what I did, because I stuck to my guns in a selling situation. I made a difference forever to the lives of a family. Yep. And that filled me with incredible self-esteem mm -hmm. that I was, I, I was enough. Uh, I was, I don't, my right to occupy the space I take up on the planet, you know, my self-esteem just grew massively because yep. I'd made such a contribution to somebody else. And also it, it gave me a completely different relationship with selling. And ever since that moment, if, if anyone in my company ever starts to you know, criticize selling or salespeople, they get that story because I won't stand for it. Right. You know? um, and, and the discovery I made at 37 after the rehab thing was it was the same thing around sales, being a sales leader, being a coach, a manager, which was when a salesman comes up to me and he's, he's had a tough upbringing, you know, he struggled at school, for instance, he wasn't gifted with the greatest academic skills or whatever, but he's always tried. He's always got up from his, he's got back up when he's been knocked down and he's just come back and he keeps going and he, he wants to be the best him that he can be. And he's got no illusions of, of grandeur, but he just wants to make something of his life. And he's got a girlfriend and he wants to get married. He's got really wholesome, simple goals. And when he comes to me and he says, Paul, Thank you. And I've, you know, I've trained him, I've coached him, I've worked with him, I've, I've, I've worked overtime with him. Yeah. And it's, it's come to, it's, 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 it's flowered. He's got success. He started selling. He's, he's found his rhythm. He's discovered the basic secrets when you first discover you can sell, you know? He's discovered that he comes to me and says, Paul, thank you for what you did for me. Me and my girlfriend now, we're getting married. We've, we just bought, we just got enough for a deposit. We've saved up for our first house. If it wasn't for you, I, this my life wouldn't be like this. I'd probably be on the wrong side of the tracks. So I want to. That is the greatest reward of all. It's worth more than all the money in the world. Yep, it's beautiful. That it's just absolute. Even now, just describing it, that hairs on the back of my neck. That's <laughs> why I do it. That's 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 the biggest gift. That was I love about this business. Yeah. When you really do discover what truly does light you up, and it's not money, it's, it's, this, it's this kind of thing. When you discover what really lights you up and you're able to engineer it again and again, and it's wholesome. Yeah. And I'm being selfish. I, I do it because I want, him to, I want these people to come back and tell me I was part of the success. <laughs> and that's where I get, that's the ultimate. But okay, it's slightly selfish, but it's actually, it's actually driven by a, a really wholesome bigger picture. For me, that is every, it's, that, that's great. Nothing can beat that. You remind me of something. If, if our viewers that are watching this have seen me talk before, pretty much exactly what you're talking about. I talk when you're a leader of a sales team, you need to be selflessly selfish. And what that means is you, yeah. put, your, you yeah. put your sales team and their success, their future, their lives, their mental, their mental health, right? Everything first. And you do whatever you can to uplift and motivate and encourage and give them confidence and educate the hell out of them and give them the tools they need to be successful. And you do that because what's gonna happen in return, that belief they now have for the company they work for, their loyalty to you, the, the amount of effort they're gonna put in because they don't wanna let you down, in a way is gonna reap greater rewards just naturally. So in a way, by you getting that recognition and performance, them showing gratitude to you, like you just described, there's no greater feeling in the world and I, I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with my salespeople when I was a full-time manager. Yeah. And yeah. I get salespeople that would always come up to me and ask me, he's like, Dominic, you know, if you were to give me one bit of advice to be successful, 
what, what would it be? And I always had the exact same answer to every salesperson. I, see, I said, if you want to be successful long-term in this business and be happy with your profession, be a mentor and a coach and a leader to others. Yes, now, even yes, if you're yes. a salesperson, not even a manager, by you going out and you know, giving a hand to somebody that's new to the business and maybe is just trying to, to, to get their pipeline built up and is struggling and maybe is financially unstable and trying to provide for their family, by you going out and giving him advice and coaching him being a mentor, kind of like a big brother to him and helping him along the way, that's going to give you so many benefits because every time you sit there and you coach somebody else, you teach yourself something, right? <laughs> I yes, can't you tell do. you how many times, I'm sure you've had this thousands of times where you're giving somebody advice and you're like, my goodness, Dominic, if you just applied this a little bit more in your life, <laughs> you'd be doing a lot better, Absolutely. right? <laughs> we're sent here to teach what we most need to learn. That's a great phrase, stuck with me. Somebody, somebody said that a long many years ago, and I thought that's terrific. And it, the best way to learn often is to teach and to relearn. You want to rediscover the, the things you've forgotten. And, and, and this applies to you know, a seasoned veteran in sales, and he or she is on a slump. And, you know, they they can't see while they're on a slump and you do you do a, the basic questioning you know what what's changed you know what have you changed about your, your pitch oh nothing i'm still doing the same things yeah. really there must be something there must be something different oh there's nothing different you know okay so what's changed for you outside of, of, of the job what's on your mind oh nothing different nothing nothing everything's all right and you know that intuitively you know this is not right but, but there's a resistance you know there's, there's a res the wall of resistance Okay, so what about your preparation beforehand, your mental preparation? Do you go in expecting to sell? Oh, you know, all the, the, you go through the whole routine. Yep. And, and, and it, it, it would be easy to sell. Well, I'm sure it's, you know, your look will change. But that's not really serving him at the highest level. The, the way to do it is to actually send him back to, to truth. And what that guy needs is he needs to be given a rookie and to be given a position of seniority for the day and to be made to be to feel good and even though your your current performance is not in keeping with your capabilities you still are a seasoned veteran and a man, a man to be respected the world champion even though he's got he's got trouble he's still the world champion he was still the one who won in the ring he got the belt so you know that that doesn't change because his current form has changed the best thing we can do with this guy stick him out with a rookie and say to, say to him Teach him all the best stuff. Yeah. Teach him your wisdom. And what happens is you put him on a higher level, a higher plane of thinking. He's now got responsibility of this young life. And immediately, all of the bad energy that, that is holding him back currently in his sales, he takes on the role of a leader, a mentor. It reignites his self-esteem and the spark. He feels like he's somebody again. Yeah. And he instantly taps that wisdom of all the great discoveries that he has made and forgotten and all the great stuff that he's not doing now because he's cutting corners because he knows all the action is in the close. So he's trying to get there as quick as possible. And when you do that, you don't get there with, you know, he's lost all the basic truths, but because you put him in this situation, by the end of the day, he comes back and his eyes are full of the fire again. The rookie loves him, and you bang him on a, a, a lead, and he sells it, and then he sells the next ten. Yeah, you know absolutely. the answer. Right. The answer is in. The answer is there. It's outside of the normal stuff, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I always said, you know, you got the right sales culture in your organization when you got your sales reps asking you to have new guys ride with them all the time. Definitely, because yeah. They want to help them and they know that, it, again, it holds them accountable for staying sharp as well. You know, I always love having new guys ride with me because I always learn something new from a new guy and it basically forced me to be on my A game because, again, when I'm demoing in front of a new sales rep, obviously I don't want to embarrass myself, right? And I want to show him how far I can go for my own ego, for my own pride. And, again, it, like you said, it reignites that fire, that flame, that drive, mm. that passion. And by helping that new rookie, it gives them that fulfillment that we've been talking about, where by being a coach and a mentor to other people, that's the best way that I've found to build confidence in myself, give fulfillment to myself, and for salespeople to do the same thing. I think too often, this salespeople, especially with what's going on now, and I wanted to bring this up because you just made a really great video recently on the whole teamwork thing going on right now, how teamwork is dying in a lot of organizations, yeah, like camaraderie. Yeah. It's a very lonely profession right now 
as lonely yeah. as it's ever been. And the whole concept of that, that culture, that teamwork, that camaraderie is dying. So I think figuring out these different ways where you can encourage these salespeople to be leaders to others, to get involved with the process, because it's a way of keeping them sharp, but also giving them recognition. It's one of the greatest desires in, 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 of human being is getting recognized. And I found Definitely. that when I, when I had a sales rep that was helping me train a rep or coming up in front of the, the sales team and delivering a script or educating on how they do things, it gave them that recognition they so desire. And, and what, you know, this business, and um, the home improvement business, uh, you, call it, you refer to it in the States as home, home sales, home services, and, and, and we can't refer to it in England as home improvements, but you know, it's, it's the same thing. And I didn't realize it was until recently, I didn't realize until we spoke um, recently that it absolutely was, and it, it was terrific to, uh, to know. Um, and it instantly made sense, sense to me because of the dialogue I'd had in the past with many of the, the guys in the States of which I've got some clients. Um, but you know what, what I love? Because this industry is unique. You know, it's absolutely unique. It allows, this is the beauty, it allows the ordinary guy or gal, a lot of the time when I was coming up through the ranks in the 80s, it was mainly guys, but it's not now. Fortunately, it is a good mix of, of guys and gals. So when I say guys, I mean both, right? So it allows, it allows any, any ordinary guy. And even... Even those of us who weren't tremendously gifted academically, you know, we weren't from Harvard or, or, or Oxford in, in, in England, where we, you know, um, we struggled or we were just little gits, you know, we, we, we were little, little, we were on the wrong side of the tracks or we were thinking wrong or we were full of ego. We didn't make the most of our, our school time. Um, but, but we're still allowed a chance. This industry gives us a chance. It doesn't ask that we come uh, with a trail of, ex, uh, of, um, of educational uh, qualifications. It doesn't ask that we come from money. It doesn't ask that we bring, you know, a whole load of written references and a glowing financial record and a perfect history. It understands that we might have made mistakes. It's not interested in our history. It's interested in our, in our potential and our attitude. And it gives you a break. It gives you a chance. It gives anybody a chance based on their attitude right now. Yeah. And that's what I love about this industry because you can have a history and a set of circumstances externally that any other vocation or real job, you know, or career, they wouldn't let you in. Right. They wouldn't let you in because they judge your history. Yeah. And how stupid are they actually? Because, you know, I mean, that's another story. But the home improvements, this does not, it does not exclude. In fact, in fact, it kind of knows the secret that sometimes the broken ones and the ones who've had it tough and made mistakes are actually going to be the greatest students, the most grateful, the most gifted, highly intelligent geniuses actually, but just the brain didn't work in the conventional way. They didn't respond to conventional teaching and conditioning. Mm -hmm. And the freedom you get when you discover the home improvement world and you realize you've found somewhere where you can fit in and you can thrive and all, all that you need to be is bloody hard working, teachable and coachable. And I really start with that's about it. Willing, hungry, there are literally no limits. You can, you can have a lovely pace of life and always be comfortable. You can be a multimillionaire and end up running businesses. There's no limits. And that's what I love about this business. It's so real. Yeah. And when I make, when, when I meet a young guy or a young girl, whatever, in, 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 in whatever circumstances these days, and they're just coming into the business or they're at their first interview or, you know, they're having, checking the business out to see if it's for them. When I see somebody or they've just come off the training course, it's their first sales meeting or the first week. Mm -hmm. And I f first meet them and I look in their eyes and I see it. And I can see it in their eyes. That thing, the thing that we had yeah. and the thing that all the guys and girls who've been successful had, that passion. When I see that in someone's eyes, I feel like giving them a big hug because I, I feel like saying, do you know what, what, what is in, in front of you? Yeah. yeah. What, you know the, the life you've got, the adventures, the incredible opportunities, the, the fun, the lessons, the growth. Yeah. The, what's in front of you? If I told you what was in front of you, you wouldn't believe me. You, you're not yet ready to believe, you're, you, but you are 
you're in for the ride of your life. I'd, that's what I'd love, I want to tell them. I love, to, I love it when I see that in someone's eyes, you know. And I'm glad that, that's, that our industry is still like that. It hasn't lost that. It's still giving people that same opportunity. I'm so happy you brought that up. I got a great story for you. Uh, so I had this gentleman. It was, I think, October of 2018. This gentleman came in for an interview, right? He sat down. I sat across from him. And you're talking about that eye of the tiger, right? That's the first thing I noticed yeah. right away. Now, this gentleman was from Honduras, and English was a second language. Now, before he came to sell home improvements on my team, he was selling cell phones at U.S. Cellular here, making maybe 30 grand a year, 40 grand at most. And he came mm. in for an interview, and I just saw that fire in his eyes, that, that confidence, that passion, yeah. that drive, that vision, that he could become a fierce closer. But what was interesting is this person had never done in-home selling in his life, didn't know anything about home, home remodeling, home improvements, home services, didn't know how to use a tape measure. And in order for him to yeah, learn our methodology, yeah. he had to first hear it in English, go back home, translate it wow. back into Spanish, and then relearn it back in English again for him to understand what I was saying. His first wow. month, it wasn't very stellar. He was struggling. He only had 25000 sure. his first month in sales. And what I did is I wrote to them for three days, all right? Just three days. I had them just observe me and record me. I'm like, just watch me in the home, record me on your phone, not video, just audio, just so you yeah, can yeah, yeah. And I want you to listen to those recordings after these three days, and I want you to do that. <laughs> so basically what happened is after yeah. three days of riding along, all of a sudden this guy ends up writing 150000 and then in 2019, <laughs> in 2019, he wrote up $3 million, was one of the highest volume producing salespeople in the history of our whole company. And I looked at his W-2, and I'm not going to say what his name is, but he made $380,000 his first full year, full year in the business. And the fulfillment that gave me, because that trickle-down effect, all the people he was able to help in his family, because he was one of those guys supporting his mom, his dad, his sisters, brothers you know, nephews, he was supporting so many people and he was able to do it effortlessly because of this new opportunity and this new gift. And that's why I believe in the methodology so, so passionately because I know what it's done for me. I know what it's done for so many and I see what it continues to do for others around the country and hopefully they're around the world very soon, right? That's obviously my vision. Yeah. But yeah. that's the beauty of the industry, you hit the nail on the head there. Now, your position there at Everest, you were the Southern Sales Director, so there's two major regions of that company? Yeah, that was, th there was many different shapes to, to where the business evolved over the years, but right at the end, into 2012, um, I finished up looking after as the Regional Sales Director. It's 100 million of 150 million turnover, 500 guys in the south of England from, right. from east to west, you know, Wales, uh, right across um, to London uh, and up as far as the Midlands. Uh, five, a team of 500 and um, we finished up, uh, they finished up doing a record 102 million pounds worth of business that year wow, nice. in 2012. Yeah, because you yeah. said your specific territory only represented like half the map but over 70% of the book of business, right? Because of the performance. Yeah, yeah. Now, going back to the beginning there, I guess, how did you find that opportunity? How did you discover the home improvement industry when you first got into it? Okay. So I left school at 16, didn't carry on for further education. I wanted to, I wanted action. I wanted money. I wanted to get out into the world. I was, um, I was impatient. With hindsight, I, I could have applied myself. I now know I was brighter than I gave myself credit for, but that's the way it went. I went out and I actually joined a, 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 double, a, a double glazing business and, and a few other businesses I was canvassing was knocking on doors. I was only 16, so I wasn't quite ready to go straight into the home selling to middle-aged people with, with, with credibility. So I started right at the bottom. For a couple of years, it gave me a good basic grounding and, and basic lessons in selling and an introduction to the, to the industry. I then moved south. And I ended up going into sales in the financial sector, selling insurance. Um, it's actually America, U.S. companies, uh, HFC Bank and Avco Trust, who were part of U.S. companies. Great sales process, terrific sales training system, uh, basically selling credits and selling insurance. And I just flew in in that. And I so I ended up going down that route. And then I ended up with a bank who were aligned to the U.K. home improvement industry. So we were lending. We were the main lenders for all the home improvement projects, fitted kitchens, bathrooms, you know, the whole works, conservatories, garden rooms, all the rest of it. It. all the main direct sales businesses with 
hundreds of millions in turnover. They did, they, they worked with that bank, First National Bank, who l lent and they, they went into the house with our, with our credit forms. So what I was doing is I, I ended up going along to home improvement businesses and their sales meetings and teaching the guys to start with how to fill out credit forms. And you know, I realized that was an extremely tedious subject and I knew that they, they needed, I could see that they needed great sales training and often in many cases the, the sales managers had just ended up becoming managers, desk managers, not leaders. And so what I started doing was I started just kind of, um, I, I gave myself permission to teach filling out of credit forms to my early twenties, but I do teaching out, <laughs> teaching how to fill out credit forms from a personal development perspective. I just drop in and sneak in. Um, little little kind of nuggets about little tips as to how how to behave when you're filling out a credit form and if how to at first introduce the subject of credit because you know you're broaching a personal subject so if you do it wrong you're going to get resistance and i just demonstrated that i had some actual insight into selling and what happened in the home that then got them asking questions and you know over the course of a year or so from just kind of deciding i was going to make my job more interesting what i did was i'd actually created a role for myself and also for my other hundred colleagues up and down the UK, I'd influenced them and said, look guys, we can really carve out a massive role for ourselves. And I even influenced our directors. I sold up was I said, look, you guys and we, all of us, we can become amazing sales trainers and finance trainers. And the added value that I'm now bringing to my clients is I'm not just teaching them how to fill out credit forms and being the rep from the finance company. I'm actually now in their eyes and perceived by them, you know, they love coming. They, they come to the meetings, they learn about selling, they learn about thinking about the, the thought life of success and the attitudes of success. And they now know that their finance penetration and the credit penetration has gone through the roof because they now know how to introduce it, how to behave, how to answer questions, how to close on credit, how to, how to dissolve their own shame of their own credit and not allow that to go in the home with them. That, you know, this has become an entire new road that I've carved and guys, we've got, to, we've got to all get on board. So then what my director says, Paul, you're onto something. So I then, internally, they made me a sales training manager. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, I was training my own colleagues and peers in the bank how to become sales trainers in the home improvement businesses <laughs> when they're teaching credit forms. Yep. And the ultimate end result was that the, the biggest and most successful home improvement companies they then, the, the, the managers and leaders and directors, when I was invited to bigger and bigger uh, events, and I always insisted, I want to get on and do a slot. I'll come to the event, but I want you to give me a slot. I was then going to conferences, so major national home improvement businesses, their annual conferences, you know, they're, they're real big affairs where they'd spend a lot of money on making it like a real show, yeah. the, the Academy Awards, you know, for their business. And I would, I'd always had a slot. So I, I, I forced myself to become a good stage speaker as well. And I just, like everything I'd done, it was about my thinking. I watched videos, I studied the best, and I was, became really good at it. And then I was, inevitably, I was offered jobs. And, and um, it was Everest that was the one job offer that was the most exciting. And at 29 years old, I moved from the bank to Everest. Yeah. And that's when I went from average earnings, too incredible and instantly it was then when i was at everest that i knew i was home yeah that's an amazing story and when we conduct sales trainings we spend four days just yeah. on the art of using financing in the closing sequence because of how important that is and it's still mind-blowing to me obviously i'm networking with companies all over the world right now technically uh, but a lot of companies in the u.s that still offer no financing at all and I'm not sure what the financial situation is throughout the world, but even in the U.S., they claim that 57% of Americans cannot afford a $500 debt right now if they were hit with it, right? I yeah. think that is that's similar around the world. I don't see, I, I don't see anywhere that, that has escaped from, from the impact of, uh, of, of everything. I think yeah. everybody's in the same boat, actually. Yes. Yeah, and that's great. accurate. So yeah. There's such a huge chunk of the market, and using the financing as a boomerang for the close, and use it as a closing tool, if you know how to sell it the right way, you know, I always explain, you know, throughout the process, you're like the customer's guidance counselor. And then when you get into the close, you're like their finance advisor, you put your finance advisor hat on and being able to confidently and assertively talk them through 
the financial obligation they have and make sure they're completely comfortable. But you being the expert in the room and being confident about explaining the financial terms and being confident and assertive when you assume the order, that's such a powerful sales tool. And I know that in my history, I've taken so many jobs away from other companies. In some cases, we're oh, twice yeah. as expensive. But because Absolutely. we had financing, it was a no-brainer. Like, well, even though you're eight grand more, we still can't afford it. We don't have the cash, so we get, we're going to yeah. do business with you. <laughs> yeah. It's the biggest objection. And no matter what objection you are actually given, ultimately, at the root of every objection, pretty much, actually, is money. It, it's in there. It's got to be. Because yeah. if it were free, would they hesitate? No. You've yeah. done a reasonable demo, you've established rapport, you've demonstrated humility, but also you've, you've established expert status through um, amazing questioning. Uh, you've got all the needs and wants, you've reframed them uh, in, a, in a way that makes them feel underst understood empathically. So when somebody feels empathically understood, they instantly trust. Uh, we've then shown them that not only should they buy what they want, but we've shone a light on what they also need, but they didn't realize. And that scored points and that's elevated our status as a trusted advisor and not just someone who wants to sell. And, and you know, we've done that. We've then created the sense of a bargain by very skillful price conditioning and gentle closing. You know, all these things that we've done to put ourselves in a strong position but assuming all of that, the only thing really that should be left is, well, can we afford this? Even if they do have a degree of trust by the end of the three or four hour presentation time you've been with them, often they still can't bring themselves, because it's just human nature, to be completely honest and say, look, Paul, you know, it's a bit beyond what we want. You know, we're just going to struggle. So, you know, it'll come out as another thing. Yeah, you know, Paul, we just need a couple of days to give, give this some thought. Don't we love? Yes, we do. It's, it's, it, you know, we just need a, a day or two just to sleep on it, Paul. Can you just give us a couple of days? We promise that you know, Monday we'll give you a call. Well, we're almost definitely going to go with it, aren't we, love? Yeah, 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 we are. Okay, so Paul, can you, can you let us call you on Monday? You, you know what it's like, Paul. It's a big decision, isn't it? It's a lot of money. And we have only just, and they end up closing you. And, but really, it's about money. But yeah. that little routine, customers are good. They can close you and you think, oh, they're so sincere. You know, you leave, you let them off the hook. You go out, you phone your manager, you say, right, I'm definitely going to get that one. I really am. You know, you really think you are. Yeah. You are going to get it. But what you've done is you've let that get to that stage because you haven't in earlier introduced in a, an extremely clever, psychologically clever way, the credit, the finance, the affordability, the money. You haven't introduced it in a way that makes them feel good talking about it. If you haven't done that, you, you are going to, you're forcing them into a position where they have to come out with a, an excuse that preserves their uh, ego and buys them some time to source the money without them telling the truth. You're forcing them into that situation. So you have to, you have to learn how to do it. And, and the skills are there. Such an important It's the same skills. And if you do that, then you have, the, you have the beauty of getting to the end and they can take the finance option without having it admitted that they need finance, without feeling any uh, loss of self-esteem or without finance having been an issue mm -hmm. in the appointment, without them feeling any inference that the only way they could buy it is through financing. You've dissolved all those, all those illusions. You've actually completely dissolved that. And you can achieve that every time. With One, with your own belief and the energy you're carrying is you, you have to get to a stage where you are comfortable with it and that you don't take your own preconceptions, your own experience in. Then it's just a case of learning the, the words, the behavior, the body language, the tonality, the answers to the basic objections you're going to get with credit because there's always going to be two or three objections around credit, the same ones, yeah. you need to have your rehearsed answers. And the more they see you discussing credit finance, very relaxed, flowing with no fear, really comfortable about it, making it that it's no issue and answering their objections in advance and very playful, they start to just observe themselves in their own head thinking, this is, this is actually, this, this is not a big deal, is it? We could use this. Yeah, it makes slowly they just find themselves the guard lowering and all that resistance lowering because of your behavior. So by the time you get to the end when you're pricing, we've already kind of agreed that, that you know, you, you're not going to give us your $15,000 worth of savings. You're going to leave your savings where they are. You're going to preserve your savings. You're going to use this money instead. 
exactly. Yeah. Yeah, being confident, and taking control. Uh, that's yeah. a skill set that salespeople especially need to adopt. Now, it re reminded me of something I heard you say in a video. I heard you say, I was watching one of your training videos on, I think it was YouTube, and you have alluded to the fact you want to have alert, relaxed, and appropriate enthusiasm. So yeah. I don't know if that was something in that specific training, but I was curious yeah. if you could elaborate on just kind of what you mean, so alert, relaxed, appropriate enthusiasm, and how that can benefit a salesperson in the home. Yeah, that, that was, I, I actually found myself coming out with that phrase just before we did that little video take. Yeah. And I've never really liked, I've, I've taught at scripts in my life, and I've always learned scripts for selling. But when I'm doing sales stuff on, on video for coaching, I like to just be spontaneous, and I like to make my mistakes, my ums and ahs. I like, I like to be real, so I don't mind that stuff. So I was just kind of doing a bit of rehearsal to see what was coming out. Sometimes the best stuff comes without rehearsal, right? Yeah. So I was seeing if, if I was at that, it was in that state, if my intuition was giving me that that day. And it gave me this phrase, and it was a calm, alert, still, quiet confidence. That was it. A calm, <laughs> alert, still, quiet confidence. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's full of contradictions. Uh, uh, but then I thought, there's something in that. Mm. And really what I was saying when we were first brought into sales, mm -hmm. and it depends what era we were brought in, but, but I think it's true of everyone, even guys coming in today. For me, it was in the 80s. It was when greed was good, and Gordon Gecko was on Wall Street, and you know Tony Robbins was first coming through the ranks. Everything was about positivity and energy and attitude, but it was, and it was all energy, and it was all, and it was all, so it was like, you've got to be positive, you've got to have energy. So to me, when someone says you've got to be positive, you've got to have energy, it instantly became this aggressive energy. It was all energy. It was all, and often it was false. It was, yeah. it was um, fake. It was put on. And equally, the, it wasn't long before customers began to kind of see through it. And, and because just because I'm full of testosterone or whatever it is I'm full of, uh, and so excited, um, it doesn't mean it's the truth, actually, which means that, I'm actually trying to get that message across. So what I'm saying in, the, in that statement is that just noise, pure noise and pure energy, isn't actually the best enthusiasm or energy to carry. But equally, that's, so that's one extreme, yeah? And I was pointing to that. And I was, having, I've done that myself as well, I've made those mistakes. And then, I was, and then at the other end of the spectrum, there's the other end, which is just, you know, you're so laid back, you're practically asleep. There's no real energy. It's a kind of like, you know, whatever. And, and that's, that's in no way inspirational. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that carries nothing. <laughs> so in between the two, there is actually a balance. And that's what life's ultimately about is the balance. And I've, I've learned balance through being at the extremes, <laughs> you know, and having got into trouble at the extremes and finally found the middle way. So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm kind of pointing to truths and and equally in truth some of the greatest truths are surrounded by paradoxes as well so even though there was some conflict in there that didn't bother me because the greatest truths of life often are paradoxes so what i'm saying is look what you need to have is a calm so that there isn't your energy isn't so hyper that you're actually almost panicking and you're sending fear to the customer because the first thing that you sell the first thing the customer buys is your energy Right. Because we are creatures of energy. In fact, quantum physics has, has proved that we're not even physical. We're actually waves. Yeah. Now that's, I'm not going to get any deeper than that. Uh, <laughs> you're safe. Uh, you're, the, you're, you're safe out there, um, the uh, community. I'm not getting, going to get too woo-woo. But actually, you know, that's what it's proved. But what, what I'm saying is we're energy. We cannot avoid our, when we're especially face-to-face, -face, but it still happens screen to screen. Mm -hmm. But we cannot avoid our energy merging. And it's like, you know, if you hang around with five millionaires, that old phrase, you know, from Confucius, you become like the five people you, you associate with. If you hang around with millionaires, you get their energy. If you hang with, around with losers, you're going to end up thinking like they do. We get the energy of the people we associate with. Yep. So the first thing that sells is if you go into a sales situation and you're in fear, the first thing you sell is fear. The customer finds themselves entering fight or flight. They can feel it in their body. They feel... Um, the release of uh, stress chemicals and they feel fear and they don't know why and they want you to leave. So yeah. that's often unseen. Well, that's the first truth. Uh, so I'm pointing to all this stuff. You've got to be relatively calm right? Um, but you, uh, and still. So don't be too animated jumping around, you know, and all, uh, uh, 
and you, you have to be relatively calm and still. But it also has to be, it has to be alert. So your energy has to be, not off the scale of enthusiasm, but you have to be alert and right in the moment, present. The whole outside world is gone. The past and the future is gone. None of it exists. The only thing that exists is you and those clients and that moment. It's yep. right now. That is the energy to take because when you're in the present moment mentally, you always are physically. If, my, if, if only our, our head was in the same place as our body physically, if we yep. were to take on our mental life and just keep it where our body goes, we'd be a lot happier. But our mental, our head's somewhere else and our body's here. So if we're here, the energy of the present moment is the best energy anyway. It's the purest. It's where everything is. It's where all the energy is tapped. That present moment, focus and energy and only, and everything else goes and disappears. That in itself is the most appropriate energy. It's pure. It's yeah. pure. It's empty. It's still. It's just pure potential. And occasionally, you will find yourself getting genuinely enthusiastic the more you get on a roll. So you let the enthusiasm, so you start with a present moment, still alert, quiet confidence. Quiet confidence is so much more seductive and attractive than over the top enthusiasm. I'm kind of pointing to that. I'm pointing to the fact that it's so much more credible to be quietly confident. Right. And your quiet confidence is just how you hold yourself, your eye contact, a, 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 a slight smile, but not, not just a slight smile. A, 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 you're sending a message of contentment that you're okay, I'm okay, and we're here to achieve something together, and I'm not in a rush to take control of the meeting. You've got your 10 steps laid out, but that energy... When you actually discover that energy and you're able to put yourself into it after spending an hour on the freeway and all the stresses of the world and you pull up outside or if it's a B2B or B2C, I'm talking B2C here, because I'm tuned into this, this genre, this niche. You know, you pull up outside, you, you've done everything to get, you've been an hour in the car, you, you having to put your life and all, your, all the crap that's gone on in the day to one side, get yourself in the right frame of mind. If you can put yourself in that space, that when you first meet them, you are in that energy, in that zone, present moment, pure, alert, still, quiet confidence. If you can cultivate that, you've actually, you've actually done 90% of the job because they're going to instantly decide within the first couple of minutes, he's all right, he's not in the sky. I think we'll be safe with him for a few hours. We can tell him the truth. He's, he's, he's just like us. He's actually really relaxed. He doesn't seem to be wanting to be in control and... It occurs to them, really realize, but this is what's happening. They're, they're starting to buy you. Then you gently lead them. And when you do it gently and with the right questioning and the right guidance, and you maintain that energy and intent, they follow. They'll come with you. Yeah. Still a lot. So a calm, still alert, quiet confidence. Yeah. The, that still has place for enthusiasm when it naturally comes. But I absolutely don't, I never have bought into this fake it till you make it stuff because it doesn't work yeah. for me. No, I'm glad you said that. You know, I train on a 130 page Bible for my sales team that has all the scripts and the closes. But one thing I always explain guys, that's just the 10% foundation of your career. The rest of it is how you're delivering the message and all that all stems from all those nonverbals. It's based on feeling and how you conduct yourself in the home. You know, one thing we train yeah. at across university is being the thermostat, not the thermometer. So when you walk in the house, you're the thermostat, yeah. Yeah. meaning that you control the environment and the customer responds to what you're doing. And, you know, they've done studies on this, that the customer's heart rate will actually mimic your heart rate. It shouldn't yes. be the other way around, right? You yes. shouldn't be yes. mimicking there because you're in control. And that transference of feeling and emotion it is going to happen whether you like it or not. So that's why it's important. Yes. I see a lot of salespeople that do a good job, maybe throughout the presentation, throughout the company story, but then they get to the close and their whole demeanor changes. You can Absolutely. see, you can, you can actually see their heart rate increasing. You can see them starting to perspire. You can see, I call them the purpose tremors that I was talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden they, they kick that customer in a fight or flight, just like that. They lose all their trust and rapport. And before you know it, uh, they basically talk themselves right out of the sale, right? <laughs> That's right. That's because of their identity. That is an identity issue. And, and this is why I, when I became a sales coach uh, back seven years ago, I invested in myself and I learned and became qualified as a, as, as a personal development mentor because I knew that I had to bring personal development with sales because yep. I had to be able to, to, to have 
great skills at, 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 at doing sessions on personal development where I could demonstrate to people the part identity plays in our performance. And I can give you the best words to say in sales. I can give you the best script. I can give you the step-by-step -step blueprint. You just follow that and say those things and you will sell and earn. But if the, if the internal blueprint is wrong, if it's being filtered through the incorrect identity, then that, that great script will never actually uh, be delivered with the right tonality and energy and then it's, 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 it's inert. It's got no life without that. So a guy who changes his, his behavior when he starts, the closer he gets to the end. So the closer he, he comes to talking about money, the more fearful he gets and he changes his behavior. Then what we have there is we don't have a training issue where we've got to teach him role playing, get him to do drills of scripts of learning at close. What we actually need to do is to um, discover the nature of his identity and overwrite it. Yep. We need to we need to teach him how to create a new identity because the identity he's got is based on old beliefs that at one stage served him. At one stage they were effective survival strategies, but they were based on the circumstances at the time. Those circumstances are no longer present, so therefore this identity is no longer present. And when they see the truth of that, we're able then to for them to cover a, an identity which is based on the right reality right now and who they want to be. And then what happens is new identity, new, new line of code in your brain, in your mind, new behavior everywhere else. If I don't believe that I, I deserve or should be talking to people about money or asking them for money, or if I don't believe I should be asking um, people older than me who are more educated and, and, and they're upper class, if I don't believe I've got the right, this working class lad that I am, to go into their homes and ask them to make a decision and give me, give me lots of money, then to me, $20,000 is a lot of money. It isn't to them, but it is to me. If I take all of that in, that identity, I'm not going to sell, I'm going to change, and I'm going to be all subservient and pathetic, and I'm going to crumble in, the, in front of them. Yep. And I've got to deal with that. that. I actually had some of that when I was a very young salesman. I'd be fine in working class homes with working class people. But when I went to rich, posh people's houses, I ended up like this kind of, like the, you know, someone off a Mary Poppins. All right, mate, you know, I'd tip my hat like this sort of young, um, young servant guy. And I wouldn't sell. And my manager took me out on a, on a, on a lead and watched me. And he said, why are you doing all this behavior? It's not you. Yeah. Just go in as the working class lad. And I changed it. And, and then I started selling it. It's all identity you know that's that's that sorry um Adam, I, I just wanted to kind of make that distinction because i think it's an important one we think i've got to work harder on my clothes i've got i've got to train him he's got to learn his clothes more but just before we make that conclusion let's just find out what his identity is how does he see himself yeah. why what, how does he feel when he's approached that if we look if we explore that often we'll find the answers there yep yeah. no that's such a great point and it all ties back into leadership management and coaching too mm. this is a yeah. huge area of weakness that I see in a lot of home improvement companies, right? Now, a lot of people, managers, owners, I think they underappreciate the influence that they have as the captain of the ship, the influence mm -hmm. they have on that salesperson's identity and their level of confidence and their belief in what they do. Because one thing that I found is if I interviewed very, very well with that new salesperson, let's say the interview is very organized, very professional, you know, obviously we hit it off. We had good uh, rapport between the two of each other. Then they take the job. Now, I have a feeling that most salespeople are skeptical about any new sales job they're starting because they don't know what the yeah, trend is going to look like. Right, is this Especially commission-only, commission only self-employed. And, yeah. and all these, we go, and all the guys have got BMWs outside. And, and there's a whole load of stuff like, can I do this? Is this real? Yeah, are they all acting? You know. Commission, like my last company did, right? And they always yeah. have doubts. Now, if I take them through a world-class training and pour my heart and soul to it, and we build that relationship, they can see how much I care about them and their education, and they come out fully armed and full radiating with enthusiasm and confidence, and when they get out there, they have that momentum coming right out of training. And my mm. point is, I see companies that they like, bring these guys in, the interview's unorganized, they're dressed in their sweatpants, they don't care. Then they bring the guy in, they half-ass the training, they give them samples, say, here you go, go figure it out, sink or swim, buddy. And then if they're not hitting their benchmarks, they kick them when they're down and threaten them, hey, if you don't hit your benchmarks, you're out. Mm. And it's really unfortunate because there's a lot of very talented salespeople out there that if they just had the right guidance, the right leadership, the right coaches mm. to guide them the right way, they would be all-stars. 
but it mm -hmm. really stems. You have to train and instill that confidence and belief into your sales team and keep reinforcing it every day, every week, every sales meeting. So, you know, Rick Grosso, my mentor, um, I asked him one time, he's like, what's the number, I asked him, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give me to lead my team? He's like, Dominic, you got to be their cheerleader. You got to, you got to build them up. This is a very stressful job. It's a very difficult proposition. Salespeople will burn out if you're negative. You got to be a positive inspiration. You got to uplift them. And then he did this illustration. He's like, I want you to think of management like an upside down triangle. I'm sure you've heard this That's a few it. times. Yeah. And, I do, but um, it, it does me no harm to hear it again, Dom. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's just it. And, you know, you see those managers that clearly picture themselves at the top of the pyramid looking down on their sales team, right? Acting like they know everything. But I always saw myself at the bottom, right? I'm at the I'm the foundation of the sales team and I'm the one that's got to lift everybody up and give them the support they need to succeed. And encourage them because again if I'm struggling if I'm in a slump as a salesperson and then I have my manager giving me threats and fueling my mind with negativity that's just gonna result in this downward spiral I can't pull myself out of Absolutely. because I have to believe in what I'm doing and everybody knows that that if a sales rep's confident he believes in what he does he loves what he does he's gonna perform at a higher level but yet I see owners and managers kicking their salespeople when they're down they don't give them the support they need. The post training molding and support and coaching is almost non-existent. It's a sink or swim mentality and they're losing a lot of talented people as a result. And my message to anybody who finds themselves in that environment, get out. Yeah, exactly. Get, get out because, because the, the owners of that business are not interested in your growth or your success. Mm -hmm. The motives are they know that there is money in direct selling, but they, they in this case, the owners have, have marked it up to make money. All they're interested in is money for themselves. They do not want to build a community and something to be proud of. They don't want to build something to look back on with prestige and pride for, for in generations to come. They just want to fill their pockets and you are a resource they're going to throw as many leads as you as possible if it burns you out there and give a shit and when you go this day you've got someone else coming right behind you so they don't care if you're in that situation get out if anybody is ever using fear to manage you get out if they're using aggression get out it's not going to change waldo waldman um he's a partner of ours at grass university is our director of leadership and development and one, he, one thing he says that it really resonated with me is you need to be their commander, not their demander, right? You need to yeah. command your team. And that's such, that's such a great line. And you actually posted a video recently on the whole concept of reigniting that, that, that teamwork, that teamwork. Yes. Culture. Yes. Now, if I'm a company struggling right now to, to get my, my team together, to get them motivated, to get that culture back, what are some pointers, some, some bit of advice that you can give maybe those owners or managers that are watching this to reignite that, that teamwork so everyone feels like okay. they're part of something bigger, right? Because it's all yeah. tying okay. in together to what we're talking about. Realize you are actually a servant. It's like that upside down uh, uh, triangle. Yep. You're a servant. It's like the president of the United States. He's a public servant. Yep. He's employed by the public. Mm -hmm. He's paid by the public. It's a fact. Yeah. Okay. The same thing applies. If the sales team all leave, I've got nothing. So uh, when, a, when a manager, especially right now, I find that you find yourself, right? This is how it is. Okay. So many situations. This is how it is. The sales manager, he was once a great lead. He was a great salesman, probably, but not all, not all the best coaches were great on the field. In yeah. fact, that's a whole discussion separate, but he was probably a good salesman and he's been a good leader. But he's even before COVID, he was pushed into being a desk manager. Hmm. So, and he had a strong team. So it was okay. He, could, he, 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 that he could get away with that. So he was kind of taking care of the paperwork and the sales numbers on the board and running a meeting and going through the motions, but he, he, and calling customers to do the, we call it in England, pitch and miss. So all, the, all the deals, that, all the leads we pitch and miss, we call the customers and find out why we missed it and all that. So he's doing all this stuff. And so he's actually found himself as, as almost like a desk manager rather than a leader. So it, it actually started before COVID. It's not all down to COVID, but COVID just exposed it. it COVID just 10 x it. It 10 x the, the, the truth and made us and took all of our strength away and took all of our comfort away. Mm -hmm. But it did start before then. Okay. And it's seeing that truth. 
but we've got a chance now to actually correct everything. And the first thing is realize you're serving them and immediately level yourself with them. Yeah. And that is to be completely transparent and to get your team together before anything else. And you don't prepare a rah, rah speech. You actually, you actually speak from the heart. Okay. Yeah. And you do is you say, right guys, I want to get on zoom. I want to, and all you do is you don't prepare a speech, but you actually just consider the real reality of what's going on here and where they're at. Mm -hmm. see the life through their point of view. Swap heads. How does it feel being them right now? And what can we achieve? And you're not trying to sell them some dream that you can't deliver, but they are feeling, right? Because physically they've not been together in regular meet sales meetings. Right. And they haven't had the opportunity to have that physical energy in a, and great banter. And when you take a break, they go out of a cigarette, they talk to each other about life and they get as much out of the cigarette break as they do the meeting, you know, and then afterwards you spend time with their peers and they've had a lot, they've, they've, it's been great because they've met their peers, they've met the team, they've been in a positive environment, they've got stuff off their chest. There's, that's gone. Wow, that's like the, where they get all the juice for the week, it's gone. And then, you know, they're on their own and, and when you're on your own, it's so easy to lower your game, you're less accountable. Uh, uh, than you were, uh, um, you, and any doubts or fears that you've got, you, nobody's there to notice them and say, hey, Paul, you're looking as if you're, uh, you're, got, you're preoccupied today, mate. What's going on? Nobody's there to, to spot that. So you, 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 you go deeper and deeper. Yeah. And you, you, so the, I mean, I could, talk, I could give you more examples, but this is what's happened. And when we get into that frame, and we don't, we don't come out and say, I think, I'm, I think the head's doing a number on me and I'm completely negged out, help me. We don't do that. That's what we should say, but we don't. Yep. We kind of put a brave face on it and hope it'll change and it doesn't. So all of your guys right now are somewhere along that line. And it's probably, it's, it's probably just safe to say that, they are, that what you're being told about how they feel and how motivated they are is not the truth. It's, it, it, they're, they're trying to convince you that it's okay it's okay boss i'm all right i'll be okay things are fine and you've got your own problems so i'll be all right so it's kind of like i'm okay mm -hmm. but they're not you can't force them so you bring them all together as a team and you speak the truth so you get them all on zoom right zoom or whatever but it's mainly zoom right mm -hmm. and what you do is you say right guys I want to talk about the truth i miss how it was do, do, who misses it You've got to start emotionally. You don't start logically and don't start talking about the sales results and don't start by asking them how they feel because mm -hmm. they won't tell you the truth. You get silence. So you just start by, you've got to realize leadership. You say, right, who misses it? Do you know what I miss? And you talk about, honestly, I miss the sales meetings. I miss the laugh we used to have. I miss the fact that we used to have a laugh, but also there were so many things we'd forget that we reminded of. I miss the little arguments we used to have. Um, I even miss them. I, I, I miss the, I miss Julie's tea. You know, and you, you can lay it on and, and you've got to put them back where you used to be when you were all a team and when you first fell in love with it. And in the great days, you didn't realize how good those days were until they were gone. Yeah. And this is a, this is this story. <clears throat> this is true because you're telling the story of the team, but it's also a paradigm for life. You're talking about life. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We don't realize what we've got until it's gone. The great windows in time, the great sales teams, the great times when we were coming up. You know, we don't see it until it's gone. This is what we're doing. We're, we're, we're speaking in a parable. We're reminding you, I miss that. Don't you miss it, guys? What else do you miss? And then hand it over to them. And what? And, Lee, and then, you know, they'll carry on. I miss this, I miss this, I miss this. And yeah. then what you do is you say, right, guys, how can, how can we bring it back? We can't, we can't break the law and all like getting our cars down the freeway and, and say, fuck you, we're going to do what we want. We can't do that. We'll end up in the, in the police station. <laughs> right, we'll end up getting arrested. But what we've got is we've got technology. We've all got a home office space of some description. Mm -hmm. We've got time. And I'm not talking about pretense, guys. We've got to have reality. But how can we get, how can we now get that back? How can we recreate that? What can we do? So, well, we should start by having a proper meeting every week again. Yeah, I think, what else? And you, you just encourage, you get them, all the ideas out. They create the strategy to go forward. You don't try and sell it to them. I mean, watch some Tony Robbins videos where he tells stories. Yeah. Watch anyone else who you admire tell stories, the real great storytellers. Just watch it and realize you too. That's what, you, that's what you've got to be to your salespeople when you have this first call. It's about speaking the truth from the, and, and connecting with the heart.
and their soul and their passion and their spirit. And that's where home improvement salespeople Derek says, well, that's what we are emotional people. We're not logical accountant types from the account from the, you know, uh, from the, the normal world. We're emotional, passionate types. That's what you've got to appeal to. I miss that. I miss how it was guys. Don't you? That is how you do it. And yeah. then it leads in, as I said, it leads into the, right, how do we recreate it? Then you get a strategy. Then you give you guys accountability. Give them jobs. Don't assume, don't lead them in everything and you, you're, you're doing everything. Lead them, give them each slot at the sales meeting. Give them a job to do. Make, give them accountability buddies. Yeah. So team them up. Julie, Jim, you just don't know each other that well. Right, you're accountability buddies. I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Make, put them into two so they have to speak to each other each day. They have to keep each other's ass about keep staying true to their commitments each week and, and hold, hold each other accountable. There's loads of things you can do. Give them jobs, make them accountable, make them feel good. Uh, and then talk to them every day, communicate with them. Um, make, make it safe for them to tell you the truth. That's the leadership that's needed now. That's the kind of leadership that's needed right now. That's what a lot of leaders, I think, don't understand just how extensive it is that your sales team will emulate and lead by your example. It was always amazing to me that I, I've done some bodybuilding competitions historically. I've done three of them. And anytime I was getting in shape, actually losing weight and cutting for the competition, and my sales force could see my physical appearance transform and my dedication and the training and pouring my heart and soul into the competition, all of a sudden I couldn't help but notice that half my sales team, as I was, was getting in shape, was getting physically fit, was losing weight, was being more physically mm -hmm. active because they emulate what their leaders do. And yeah. when describing there, it makes all the sense in the world and it's something that I always try to encourage is be having open dialogue with your sales team and leading that emotional conversation first, opening it up very emotionally and that's going to, basically cause them to open up. And I think it's important for leaders to do that as a group. And I think it's just as important to have those conversations individually with your salespeople. So we have complete open transparency. You just get whatever's bothering you off your chest. I want, again, no holds barred. You can have that open dialogue. And then of course, have those heart to hearts with your sales team. You know, that one-on-one -on -one attention that they need and that, that team camaraderie, that's, again, like you said, that's what's lacking today more than ever before. And we, we start to take for granted, as you said, the, the comforts of the, the team being able to just get together on their own and almost establish that, that team camaraderie without much effort on your part, right? But now the owners have to step up to the plate and they have to lead by example and emulate the things they want their salespeople doing, right? What I enjoy most now is I'm finding I'm doing more leadership coaching at the moment, actually, certainly since, since COVID has started. The people that come to you the most are the top closers. Yeah. The guys at the bottom are the average guys. They don't. It's the top closers. They come to me for coaching because they want to stay top because they know that if they give up on the coaching, they're going to drop. But what I've found is more and more I've got sales ma managers of, of teams, managers of managers. So, you know, high level coming to me and asking for leadership coaching. We get promoted because of performance and ability and attitude. But what we don't get is when we get promoted, to, we, we, you can find yourself in this industry, you can find yourself a newcomer to a great salesman in a year and then running a successful team in two years and running a team of 300 people and, and, and a huge proportion of the country, country in three years or less. You can find yourself in that position, but what you probably ha haven't had is that when you've had those promotions, you probably haven't had high-level leadership courses. I wanted to talk about something, obviously, on this podcast, because I do find your story very fascinating. So you stopped um, as the director for Everest Home Improvements in 2013. You literally just took the leap of faith. You didn't really ha necessarily have a, a set plan of action, uh, but you really threw yourself out there. And within one year, you got nominated or you won the award for the UK Sales Coach of the Year. Because I didn't, I, I didn't have it as a goal. It just wasn't. I'd never would have believed it. The universe doesn't just give us things randomly. Yeah. What it does is it gives us what's, what's at, the, at the right of equal energy. So if we are operating with no fear, doing whatever it takes, operating from truth, mm -hmm. playing our biggest game, committed to doing the next right thing, teachable, compassionate, compassionate and passionate. All, if we're all these things and we're living it, we're not just trying to be it, 
like, you know, the false pretend, we're actually really doing it, then the energy that we are vibrating at, the energy that we are at is, is a high light energy. It's very high, a very healthy energy. Yep. And therefore what happens is we attract more high light energy. So that's why we suddenly get these incredible gifts that we, I do I deserve this? Well, you attracted it. You didn't realize you were, but you were operating the game. Your game was at such a high level consistently that you actually pulled it to you. And I believe that. Now, I don't on a daily basis go any deeper than that and that, because that's not what I was put here for. I've got a fascination with it, but I wasn't put here to be a teacher on that level. I'm put here to, 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 to teach what I teach, which is selling, communication, leadership, right? That, that's it. But I'm still fascinated, and I think I should point out these things, just as simple truths, Yeah. I've wanted to start a tra sales training business because when I first started in sales, the sales trainers that came and ran the courses and had the great cars and I thought, oh God, that's a great job. And I never lost that. So I thought, right, now's the time. I'm in my early 40s. I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve. I've had all the rehab crap and everything. And now I, I, I'm, I'm kind of got rid of all my demons. I'm happy with who I am. I've come back and achieved even better results after all of that and rebuilt the business again. And I've, I don't have anything to prove for myself. So just staying with Everest would be just doing it again. It would actually be staying there for the safety and the money. And that was a big thing. So that, right, if I walk away from this, I'm walking away from the security blanket mm -hmm. of a senior manager position with a guaranteed very high income and car and everything else. And all of that security. And I'm walking away from that. It's none of that. I had to face reality. I thought I was. I thought, no, I'll be okay. I'll be great. You know, I've always survived. And, and I, that was the degree to which I analyzed it. And I just made the jump. And, and then I found myself in my first week as a sales coach. The phone didn't ring. Then I went to, to an event, a coaching event. And it was that that was where, where I found the truth. Well, I'm listening to conversations. I'm watching the presentations. Though when they get up and talk on the stage, they've got a life story, a, a backstory. They hold the audience in this problem. And then they do this thing at the end where they actually pitch their products and they sign, they have people go into the back of the room to buy their products. So they finish their, their talk by earning several thousand pounds. I, yeah. thought, I haven't got that. I haven't got any of that. And they've got thousands of people on their email list and they've got websites and they've got YouTube channels and podcasts and funnels. And <laughs> I'm like, what is all this? I, I've been in an, in an organization for 15 years. The only thing I knew was internal email i had some linkedin contacts but i thought linkedin was like interviews and stuff job i didn't realize what it was i thought facebook and everything else was for kids yeah okay. i'd never been on a webinar i'd never been on a webinar even as a viewer let alone running one yeah. i had i had no no entrepreneur co friends and no industry contacts i had no speaking experience outside of the in, inside of my organization I had no leads, I had no brand, I had no website, I had no domain, I had no products, I had no marketing, I had no unique value proposition, no value ladder, no tripwire offers, no one-time offers, no um, high ticket offers, no nothing, no referral system, no strategy, um, no buyer persona or perfect target audience, um, none of this stuff, nothing. But I also, uh, there was something else I didn't have any of, and that was fear. Mm -hmm. And I was willing to do whatever it took. And I sat there and I thought, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't, if I just try and survive without learning this online thing, yeah. I'm done. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I can make up for a lot of the difference with my abilities. And I knew I had that. I knew that that was strong. Mm -hmm. But I, it's too big a path to cross. I've got to learn. I've got to get into the real world and I've got to become competent online. Otherwise, I haven't got a chance. I was only driving the car because it was a company's car for a short period and the laptop and the phone. So I also didn't have a, a, my own phone, laptop or car. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and, so, and I, because I'd left on my own volition, I didn't leave with some big handshake or I hadn't negotiated a, 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 a deal. I'd left and that was it. So the remaining capital I had, I invested in two coaches. And I didn't, I didn't play small. I got, I paid like, you know, proper money for coaches. Mm -hmm. um, and they, and I threw myself into it learning online. So that was one side. I learned the online and within three months, I actually had everything that I just said, I didn't have the full, everything I just then 
presented to you, Dom, as not having, I had it all. And the irony in now, as I talk to you right here from Bali today, the irony is not lost on me that right now I'm, I even teach people how to launch business in 30 days, even if they're starting from scratch and they've yeah. got nothing online. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I say the reason I do this is because this is where I was. I'm going to remove all the worry and crap that I had to deal with and I'm going to guide you through it hand by hand, hand, hand in hand. So the irony that I know teach that is, is, always makes me smile. But anyway, that was one side. But the real breakthrough was the fact that I'm, I'm thinking, right, I've now got to compensate. I can't wait three months to learn online and then try and have, a, you know, have another go at coaching. I've got, to, I've got to commit myself to learning, but I've also got to act now. I have got to penetrate this marketplace now and i cannot start locally and play small and start at the bottom like anyone else i'm 43 i'm coming from behind the eight ball i've got i've got to actually do something right at the top level i've got to do something disruptive i've got to do i've got to really be um i've got to have loads of audacity Uh, but i've also got to have the ability that when i get myself the opportunity i've got to deliver so what i did was a thought, right, who's your, who's your target audience? And it was an hour, an hour and a half away from London in the, world, in the countryside. I'd done some work and some look, I looked online and I'd done some research and I found that my, my clients at that time, it was entrepreneur communities uh, and networking with there's thousands of entrepreneurs and new start entrepreneurs and startup businesses and all the rest of it, where these guys don't know how to sell. Mm-hmm. They're really passionate about their product and their business, but they don't know how to sell it. That's that immediate win. And also personal development communities. Yep. So these people, are, they've got small businesses or they're aspiring business owners or they're new coaches and they're passionate about their NLP or their coaching or whatever, but they've got no idea about selling. And a lot of them have actually got a negative blueprint and a negative selling uh, blueprint so I can help them. So, but I've got to get in front of them. So I thought, right, what I've got to do is I've got to turn up at events I've got to charm the organizer and I've got to get on that stage before the main speaker. And I've got to get on and I've got to talk myself in to getting on that stage to being given a slot. Yeah. That's what I could do. Because if I can get on there, I know I won't screw it up. I know I will get them right in the palm of my hand when I start talking about, I start talking to them about how they talk to themselves in their own head about, the fact that they can't sell effectively and they need to learn to sell, otherwise they're gonna run out of cash. And I could I had it, I knew how to speak to them, I knew how to do it from the stage, and I knew how to give them a few lines and do some examples by saying, right, who's got a business? And I'm gonna tune into it and I'm gonna give you your elevator pitch right now with no preparation. I did some of that. I thought I'm gonna put myself right in the spot, on the spot. I knew I could do it, but how was I gonna get into that position? And I just, had to, I just had to do what I described. So I did. I got on the train. I'd not, I'd nothing booked. And no, nobody, nobody knew me. I got on the train, turned up at the events, turned up early, met the organizer, introduced myself, told them exactly what I wanted to achieve, told them the story I just told you now. No lies, no crap, absolute truth. They, but, but once they heard the absolute truth, they were like, wow, I'll give you five minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Because when you do give, when you do tell the truth, and you haven't got some crappy story that's just some nonsense, you know, you tell the, tr- the real truth, it's actually more ex- inspirational and fiction. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, and and it's great to actually tell the truth because then you can live with yourself, right? I, 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 I tell you, it's a fair play. That I, I, you got guts. So, of course, I'll give you five minutes. You can have a go tonight before um, Warren does his talk. So this is the first one, and I got me five minutes. It turned out to be nine minutes. Everywhere I went, I recorded. I've still got that nine minutes on my phone. <laughs> and I use that I, when I do webinars or I'm speaking I, in the appropriate leadership or whatever, I'll say, here, listen to this, my first nine minutes ever. And then when I, when I stood down to nine minutes, they got a round of applause and he shook me and he went, well done, mate. I want you to come back and do a full main keynote speaker slot because I'd also sold myself to him. And I, as soon as I knew, he said, I want you to come back and do a keynote slot. Two people came up to me and said, can you come do some training? So I, I sold two training days immediately, yeah. immediately, instantly, that before I left that night, I was doing it. Like it was invoices tomorrow. So I'd instant, do instant, a little bit of cash flow. 
And then on the train, it turned out I was getting the train back because the main speaker of Warren was on the train, lived in my town. And he's like a, an influencer in the UK, thousands of people he knew. So on the train back, he gave me loads of names and introduced me to people. The, the next morning I woke up and I had a LinkedIn recommendation on my talk from the night before from Warren. I'd never even asked for it. What an amazing thing for a guy to do, for an influencer to do. Yeah. He knew exactly what was going to help me. Wow. All serendipity. Forget fake it till you make it. Faith it till you make it. So yeah. fake it, faith it, faith it. I showed faith. I got on the train. Yeah. And in doing so, I created an alternative reality. I created, you see, all realities and all potential, all possibilities are there in the quantum field anyway. They're all there. I chose, yeah. I chose the one that wasn't currently happening. And, and I carved it out and it happened. And then I thought, right, I'm going to do the same with the personal development community. And it did. But that, went, that turned into a different opportunity. They said, right, we want to create... Um, uh, seminars and we did loads of seminars with them whereas with the first one I then went back and did the keynote event and I, I had then I had a little program worked out and I learned a bit so I did I sold a group package joined the group Facebook group webinar jam I think it was then it was just before zoom so it's still Skype but it was live calls live coaching calls with a group uh, email support stuff in a Facebook group, you know, this, that, and the other. And I did that. I sold and did a training program on a system I created called the stress, the sales method, which I would later launch on wall street in New York. God, that was another serendipity. Um, but I then went back to the first one. And after the end of my speech, I saw my group program and 47 people or whatever bought it there. And then Every, I just completely changed my entire life. In the same, in the other community, the personal development community, it was the same thing happened, but for them, it was, we did a, we did seminars, but I ended up with them uh, having the whole community. We, we, we had three day, one day seminars. It's terrific. Absolute amazing. But I've recorded every, all of it. And I've got those three days uncut live audio from the audio mic I was on. So professional audio. And I'm now ready right now, seven years, I'm actually ready to release that as a product because in there is three days of yep. the best sales and personal development intertwined that you'll ever, ever come across. Seriously, because it was at the point where I was bringing everything I'd ever heard from everywhere in my life and, and teaching this audience. I was right at the beginning of the adventure. It was just so, when I listen to it now, I'm like, wow, that was so good. You forget how good things are. And you underestimate your own stuff, actually. You start, oh, well, my stuff's not that great. It was. <laughs> it was good. So I was left with that. And of course, then after that, because I'd created that, I now was operating at a different level. And I was proud of myself mm -hmm. because I, it was, it did take balls to do that. And I was okay for money because I, I had clients now. So that was happening too. Oh, great. Really could. I'm, I knew I was born to do this, but I could have easily just thought, this is not for me. I'm, I, it's too much against me and backed out. And I was so glad I didn't. Somebody from the personal development community nominated me for something. And I'm not, I thought, oh God, I'm not going to go to that. I'm not going to win that. Offer. And, and I still felt like a bit of a fake then. There was a few of them nominated as well. And we all went along and got, got me black tie on. And when they said my name, I was just speechless. Yeah. <laughs> and you won it. Wow. <laughs> now that then, that then opened a whole, a whole new avenue of doors. Yeah. And then I actually started marketing it and using it to my advantage because that's what you do. If you're clever, you work out. You, so, you know, I'd, I'd use that as in how I framed who I was, the sales coach of the year and all the rest of it. But actually the real stuff deep down was, wow, how amazing the stuff that, can happen for us if we refuse to allow fear to establish a foothold in our psychology. So, so long as you do actually have skills in, and experience in what you're trying to do, then anything is possible with the right mental game. You know, you and I met not too long ago and within a little bit of talking with each other, we found a connection, <laughs> right? And that's what I love about this podcast, mm. whether we're dealing with somebody right next door or somebody as far away as Bali, Indonesia. So the fact <laughs> that we're doing this, uh, it makes me very happy because I really like to diversify our content and having a fresh perspective on the art form of selling and influence and just the overall, the mind over matter, successes between the ears, uh, I think is incredibly valuable uh, for people watching this. Now, obviously, I'd be doing myself a disservice if I didn't end on something Grass University. Um, I had the pleasure mm. of having you tour our platform. And obviously, 
you're, you're an absolute monster online. You have an incredible following, especially in the UK. You know, what was it about Gross University that first caught your interest? And of course, after seeing your platform, how could they benefit from an e-learning site like uh, Gross University? I need simplicity, actually. And, and that's the first thing about Gross University is the whole platform is really simple to navigate. I can find myself in seconds. I know which step of the sales process that I want to get hone up with some skills on. I could be there in seconds. But, but I'm done. I'm watching. I'm watching you. I can access the, the, the sales training anywhere, anytime on any device. Um, the quality of the, of the training is real world, great, realistic stuff. It's, it's a real deal. If I learn it, I mean, I just recognized it instantly as the truth. Yeah. So there's so much stuff online in terms of training and academies and all the rest of it. Uh, so much choice out there in terms of the seven steps, 10 steps, 12 steps, 15 steps, this, all the secrets and all the rest of it. That, that you know, it's how do we clear the truth from the false? Yeah. Um, and all I can say with absolute sincerity is when I look at a sales process and when I see it and when I watch it being discussed and recommended, I can instantly see the truth. I know what works. I know, I know what works in sales and what doesn't. Yeah. I know yeah. nobody's going to tell me that something works if I know it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, and you guys were talking about what I'd experienced for 20, 30 years in different part of the world, the same psychology works. So you, I knew instantly that your 10 step process is based on reality of what works to the human mind. Yeah. And, um, the, simplicity of how it's taught is great because you uh, Einstein said if you don't if you can't explain it enough so that a six-year-old would understand it you don't know it well enough yeah <laughs> I oh that's and a, so a, true that's such a great quote I tell it to sales trainers all over is you got to break it down to kindergarten level and not to yeah. salt the intelligence but that's how well you should know it. So you can dissect it down to, to that level because of your yeah. understanding of the process. It's true. And it, it also applies, you know, the, the world's great copywriters, right? Copywriting, amazing art and skill. Second only to selling, by the way. <laughs> Copyright. My copywriter friends won't like that. But no, it's a massive skill, copywriting. Yeah. That's another way you can earn on, on capped income. But the greatest copywriters, they take the copy and... There's, a, there's this thing called the Flesh King Cade in, uh, score. And it, you, you, copy, you paste your copy into this generator and it scans your copy. And then it gives your copy a grading. The perfect score is 10 to 13 years. So what your sales copy should be, that if 10 to 13 year old in grade school could read it and understand it, then that's the copy you should publish. If it's any older, if your copy is suited, a 10 to 13 year old can't read it, but a 14 plus, you've got to simplify it. You've got to remove stuff and make the words shorter. You've, yeah. got it to, you've got to get it because 10 to 13 year old copy, that's what converts best. So it's the same principles. Yeah. That's wow, awesome. how incredible is that? Simple. And, and I saw the same simplicity when I got onto Gross. So I thought, this is easy. I'm, I'm, in, I'm into it straight away. I'm not stretching my head. I need a training session with someone in order to be able to access it. I was off. And I love that because if, if, if the first thing I have is frustration work, get me navigating the system, I've already, I've already switched off from it. Yeah. Yeah. My main goal anytime I do any training, whether it be online or on stage, is I don't like trainers that have all this fluff and filler is I want to get straight to what works. Yeah. Let's get down to brass tacks. I'm going to teach you everything I know. This is real meat and potatoes advice that I can give you that I know is going to be effective for you. And when people leave, when they listen to me, they realize they, they always take something really valuable away. They don't have to see me for three days, whether it's watching me for five minutes or watching me for hours, they're always going to take something valuable away. And that's really my goal is to really get down to what I know works and without all the fluff and filler and kind of the bull crap that, that a lot of trainers. Yeah. Deliver. What I also like is that I'm, I, I'm not being sold something every five minutes. I'm not yeah. being upsold something or having pop-ups come up on the screen. I'm, I've actually, I'm, I'm, I'm there to enjoy a product and, and that's it. You're yeah. not leading me to spend more money. You, you just want me there to teach me the steps. This is a program that's teaching you how to sell a program, be, be successful. Now you've got to buy it. Yes, of course you have. Um, it's also price great. The price is terrific. It's not, it's not like bargain basement, nor, nor should it be because it's top class stuff, mm -hmm. but it's affordable yeah. and, and simple. It works. It's the truth. Yeah. What else do you want? And, and that's all there. And um, so for me, that's what makes for a successful online sales training program.
Oh, I love it. And I appreciate the, the, the kind words there. And okay. obviously, those that have watched this podcast, clearly Paul Atherton has a lot he can offer your company. So now if I'm a home improvement company all, anywhere in the world and I want to reach out to Paul Atherton, how can, that, how can they connect with you and obviously take advantage of your coaching and your mentoring? Thank you, Dom. You want to talk to me whether you're a salesman or whether you're a CEO of a business and anywhere in between, you're safe having a conversation with me. In other words, you're safe to have a conversation and just have a conversation. You want to, you want to work something out now? Great, we'll do it. You want to talk again in the future? Great, that's fine. Okay. So that's the first thing is yeah. you can have a conversation without a great big sales pitch. You can reach out on LinkedIn if this is LinkedIn. You can also reach me via my site. And what I love is the bit of, another bit of separate serendipity is your tagline is, yes, you are a closer. Yes. Yes, you are a closer. Yes, love that. Closer. And my site, my website is www.closers.com. So mine is C-L-O-Z-R-S, closers. Okay. Um, and if you pop that in your URL, you'll be able to uh, find me there as well. Closers.com, C-L-O-Z-R-S. That's it. Thanks, Dom. Yeah, see, it was meant to be. Well, another amazing podcast <laughs> with, a, with an incredible sales icon. And again, uh, Grass University, again, talking to people from the other side of the world. So thanks for taking time here yeah. well to be on our show. It's been great. It's been a pleasure. It's yep. been a pleasure. Appreciate those of you who sat through the podcast here. And as always, <clears> you know the tagline. What is it, Paul? Yes, you are a closer. Yes, you are. Thank you.